everyone, I'm Carolyn from the Lantern of Chagrin Valley and welcome to Carolyn's Caregiving Connection. It's a weekly program that we offer uh, providing resources, information for our caregivers at the Lantern and all across the United States. The Lantern of Chagrin Valley is a sister community to the Lantern of Madison and the Lantern of Saybrook, all located in Northeast Ohio. I want to thank everyone who's been tuning in to these weekly programs. They are live. They're also recorded. They're posted on our websites. They're posted on our Facebook pages and they're posted on LinkedIn. Most recently, we've added them to YouTube. So just about anywhere you're seeking information, you'll be able to find us under the Lantern of Chagrin Valley, as well as Carolyn's Caregiving Connection. We really appreciate your comments. We certainly welcome your questions and your recommendations for topics and speakers in future programs. This particular program is not live, it's recorded. I'm in my home uh, office here this morning. And uh, so today our topic is assisted living, how to get started. You know, we've just come now to Labor Day weekend, kind of the end of the dog days of summer. And for those of you who are caregivers to someone living at home, probably been able to do pretty well through the summer. The weather is good. People are able to get out of their house. We can take care of, you know, groceries and errands and doctor's appointments, all those kinds of things pretty readily for our loved ones. But once the uh, fall comes, some of us may be returning back to work. Perhaps you've been working remotely. You may also be um, dealing with children in school. So now you've got some different commitments for a school time and sports activities, what have you. And you may also uh, be thinking ahead to winter. You know, that cold weather and snow, at least here in Northeast Ohio, will be here before we know it. So the person who's been doing pretty well at home independently across the summer, and even with a lot of supports from family, friends, and even uh, community agencies, may be a little bit more at risk in the winter. We certainly don't want uh, individuals trying to go back and forth in the driveway to take their trash cans and pick up their mail, uh, dealing with trying to get to and from the store, medical appointments. Uh, people who might be very isolated in uh, bad weather become uh, very much at risk, not only for depression because of the isolation, but also for falls. They're trying to do too much on their own. And I spoke in a recent program about uh, someone that a family called about and she was doing her laundry in the basement in those old fashioned houses like some of us still have and using her walker to get up and down the steps and carry a laundry basket, if you can just imagine. So we don't want our loved ones to be at risk for any physical harm from falls. We don't want them to be at risk because they're not eating well. They're just not cooking, they're snacking. Uh, we don't want them to be at risk because they're really not moving very much in their house. They may have kind of, uh, I call it living inside the donut. You know, they're now just pretty much in the bedroom and kitchen or they're in the living room and kitchen. They sleep in a recliner. Uh, they do what we call table walking. So as we walk, we touch the counter and the chairs and what have you. They're not getting full strides. They're not getting good breathing all those kinds of things. So it puts them at risk for many things. So if you've come to that point, it may be time to at least do the homework and learn about assisted living, what it is, what options you have in your community, no matter where you live across the country. So one of the first things you wanna think about doing is um, getting that basic information. So a good place to start is your local Department of Aging, your local senior center, and your area agency on aging. And the whole United States is broken up into geographic areas. So we all live in a county, no matter what state you're in, that county has a senior center allocated to it and it has a department of aging. The whole United States is also broken up into area agencies on aging. And in Northeast Ohio here, we have the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging, or WRAAA, covers many counties. Those are the free starting points, the three starting points for you. If you don't have the phone numbers, no worries. You don't even have to go on the computer to look it up. You call 211. So just like we call 411 to get someone's phone number, and we call 911 to get emergency uh, assistance, we call 211, which is the national information and uh, referral uh, source for every county in the United States. So again, you're gonna ask for the senior center for your area, the local department on aging for your county, and the area agency on aging. When you make a call there, you're going to say, I'm interested in learning about assisted living. 
is there someone on your staff that can help me? If you call the Area Agency on Aging, they have a whole program and protocol they're going to give you to a person who is basically going to stay with you and hold your hand until you get connected to that right individual who's going to let you know all about whatever's available in your area, as well as community, um, other sources like home care, special projects maybe where they're going to help you work on the house repair, snow plowing, all kinds of things. Those programs are often very unique to a county because they're based on funding. And so those uh, folks at the Area Offices on Aging and Area Agency on Aging, they'll know about those programs and they'll help you with that. The next thing that you can do is um, begin to think about what's most important to you in the search. Is it location? You want to find a community that's near to where you're going to be so that it's easier for you to visit. Is it pricing? Maybe there's some concerns about pricing there for you. Is it going to be the types of services offered? So not all assisted living communities are the same. Some are small, some are large. Some offer the services in little houses, some offer them in high rises. Uh, you may find that some um, will permit pets, some won't. Some permit driving, some won't. Uh, some may permit um, people to still work and, and actually live in an environment like that. So it's again, very, very different. Uh, each of us is different. So we all live in different houses uh, ourselves right now. We go to different restaurants. So you'll know what's most important to you and potentially then what's the most important to your loved one. It may be that you want to have a therapy department. You need therapy services. You may find that socialization is the most important thing. You want a robust calendar and things to do. You may know that food is a significant issue for your loved one and they want um, chef prepared meals. Uh, you may have somebody that only wants uh, the continental breakfast type of a uh, breakfast meal, if you will, served whenever they want it in the morning, not at specific times. So again, we're all different. Those are the things you can look for. So once you start thinking about um, what's most important to you, you can also go to a website called Assisted Living Compare assisted living compare it's um, actually uh, developed by cms the center for medicare and medicaid services and it uh, kind of is in alignment with another website they have nursing home compare they have hospital compare and home health compare and they've created these websites to really help families and um, potential uh, clients if you will have one source to go to to get all the information they need so if you go to assisted living compare you can google it uh, what you'll be able to do is put in a zip code and then you can use some filters. I want one that allows smoking. I want one that allows pets. And you do a few little, uh, you know, check marks on those filters and you'll get a list. So from that list, you'll have name, address, phone number, websites, you'll know ownership, and then you can continue and learn all about that community. You'll look at their past surveys from their Department of Health. You'll be able to look at customer satisfaction information. You'll be able to look at staffing ratios. I mean, tons of information. And you could easily spend a few hours doing this. So it's a great weekend, nighttime activity when you're watching TV. Go to Assisted Living Compare filter by zip code, filter by those things that you've identified are most important to you, and you'll get a list. Well, right now, across the United States, most assisted living communities aren't doing live tours. We're not allowing people in our building because of the COVID restrictions. But we are doing virtual tours, which means you give us a call, and we'll actually set up a personalized appointment, and we'll either do FaceTime, Zoom, or some other uh, method to take you on a walking tour of the community. We may also have some that are pre-recorded and we'll just simply send you a link. We can then show you exact suites. So if you've told us what you're looking for and we have one of those types of suites available, we'll make a video of that exact suite for you. So you see the view, each room, you'll know exactly what you know you would have seen on a live tour. So that's something that again, most assisted living communities are doing that right now. They certainly can mail information to you, but more and more of us are getting away from the old brochures and doing the um, virtual tours and then we put a lot of information on our own websites. So each assisted living community should have a website and I would venture to say almost all of them have a Facebook presence. So on Facebook, you look up the name of that community 
and just by scrolling down, you'll get a feel for the lifestyle. They'll have lots of photographs of events. They'll have information about, you know, various things that they're doing. For instance, at our community right now, we're doing voter registration and absentee ballots. We've had some really fun special events this week, and that's where you might see photos of those kinds of things. And every community does that. So that gives you a start right there of the things that are going to be a beginning point so that you don't get overwhelmed. It's an emotional time when you are looking into assisted living for someone else. You know what you might want. You're not always sure if you know what they might want as well as what they might need. So there's want versus need. So it's a little tough sometimes emotionally and that's why beginning the process by you know getting a piece of paper and writing down what are the most important criteria for you and then searching by zip code. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. It was already invented. You don't have to reinvent it. You just have to roll it. And so those first phone calls that I mentioned will be get you on the, the path, if you will. The next things you want to think about in talking with the assisted living community is what are they going to offer to you in terms of the space? They may have studios. They may have a one bedroom. They may have a two bedroom. They may allow couples to share a one or a two bedroom. They may not. That's all depending on their licensure. Some may be furnished, some may not. Some may charge extra for things like cable TV, telephone, internet, uh, guest meals, transportation. So those are the questions you wanna ask about. You know, um, what other accommodations or amenities do they offer to you? Do they have patios or courtyards? Do they have a bus? Can they take people on outings, you know, to look at the scenery, go for ice cream? Are they affiliated with any special um, hospitals? Uh, special medical programs? Uh, do they have physicians that come in house so that you don't have to go to outside doctors? Is there a beauty salon? Um, do they have relationships with schools? Again, all the things that are most important to you, ask those questions so you can determine availability as well as pricing. Now, uh, the assisted living community, when you move along in your conversation with them, uh, you may uh, ask them about what to bring. And we've actually covered that on a previous program but they'll be able to even uh, offer you a checklist. If they don't, give me a call and I'll be happy to give you a checklist uh, similar to the one that we use for our families. So if it's furniture, they're gonna tell you, you need a twin bed, a hospital bed, a double bed, the bed linens. Uh, they'll give you a listing of what type of clothing to bring. Of course, you definitely don't wanna send a lot of wool items. You wanna send things that are easily laundered. They'll let you know if items have to be marked. Uh, they'll let you know about Appliances, can you bring certain appliances? Can you not bring certain appliances like hair curling uh, devices or um, toasters? You know, every community is different. So those are the things that they'll have on a list and that'll help you get prepared so that even while you're researching, you can be looking in the home to say, do I have a twin bed or a double bed? Do I have the bed linens? Do I need to buy some things? Does someone else in our family perhaps have something that I'm looking for? An extra lamp, a floor lamp, an end table, those kinds of things. So uh, get that list and that becomes your planning guide, if you will, to uh, begin to check off items that you can put to the side perhaps or uh, just know that you've got them and you're ready to go and you'll be prepared. When you start packing those items and you're packing boxes, my suggestion is you just use a piece of tape or a name tag or an old envelope, something that you can you know, uh, tape on top and one box says toiletries, one box says clothing, one box says books, one box says family pictures, because you're really probably not gonna be able to move your loved one in. You're gonna be dropping items off at a loading dock or a move-in area, and it'll be the staff putting things away. So help them out by marking the boxes, and that way if you're looking for something early on, it'll be easily found. So now the next step in looking for assisted living information is to think about pricing. Medicare does not come into play in any assisted living community. It does not pay for the room and board. Most assisted living communities are private pay. And you kind of have to think of it like a hotel. You know, if you were going on a trip, you have all kinds of options from a motel to hotel to five-star hotel, you know. So you are gonna choose for yourself what's most important to you on your vacation. Same thing with assisted living. We've talked about some of the differences between the communities. So you're gonna look at each of those and which ones are more important to you. Uh, it's pretty um, you know, clear that if you're looking for more and more specialty services, it may be more expensive. So um, there are still some assisted living communities that people share a room or share a suite, unrelated people. That may work for you. 
Uh, for most people, they want the private accommodation. So it could be a studio, could be a one bedroom, it may even be larger than that. Uh, if you are going to have some amenities, like we mentioned, cable TV or phone or internet, find out if those are extra. They are not in our lantern buildings. But if that's an extra cost, you wanna add that on. If you are going to need a memory care community, that typically is going to be more costly because of the higher staffing and the specialized programming, as well as all the security features. If you need to have a therapy program in-house, that may be an extra cost. Now the therapy services may actually be billed to Medicare and secondary insurance because it's considered outpatient, just like it was, uh, would be rather, if you were going from your own home right now out to get a therapy service. You might also find that there's some uh, things that are going to be additional for you if you want um, different food options. So in a building that has a chef and has you know more farm to table and fresh foods and offers all three meals, there may be a different cost than a community that only offers a small continental breakfast and a choice of lunch or dinner. So you have different options in different states. You're gonna discern what's important to you and then the cost aligned with that. So Medicare does not come into play for assisted living. Medicaid can come into play, uh, but very few facilities actually participate in the Medicaid program. And that is because the cost of care is significant and the reimbursement is not. So that's really the, the bottom line for all of it. So make sure if you're going to need Medicaid, have that conversation up front so you're not wasting time on both sides and a community that you may not be able to go to. If you need the Medicaid uh, program, it may be called the Assisted Living Waiver, ALW. That's what it is called in some states and particularly here in Ohio. So there is an application process and you have to complete that. You have to get approved and then you get a piece of paper which is called NOA or Notice of Action and that's what you give to the community. So there's still a cost. Um, the individual is able to keep a small amount of money each month and the rest of their monthly income comes to the community that participates in that program. So that's something to find out about. Uh, you may also qualify for what is called aid and attendance. And this is for um, veterans and spouses of veterans who served at particular times uh, in the military. So if that is your situation, find out about eligibility online. It's called aid and attendance, or every county has a veterans Services Commission, a Veterans Services Commission in every county in the United States. Find that number, call 211, remember, and get that number, make an appointment, and they're going to ask you for some information. You're going to be looking at military records, specific times of service, and usually it's combat times, and they'll educate you, they'll assist you with that application process, but it can give you up to almost 2000 a month, so that's something to look into if that's your situation. The next thing that you want to do is, um, you know, take that step back and have conversation with your loved one. Do they agree it's time for assisted living? Do they feel that they'll be safe without it? Um, what is important to them? What questions can you both ask? Can they be with you when you're doing the virtual tour so they can see everything themselves, be part of their whole discussion and have the choices so they're not feeling like someone is making decisions for them and about them. So if that's something that you can do, please do that. Uh, if you have siblings involved, if you have an elder law attorney, if you have a trust officer, inquire uh, of you know what's important to them. Can the you know wealth advisor or the elder law attorney advise you in any way on steps that they may have taken with other families? You know, again, no need to reinvent the wheel. So when you make those first calls to the community, you've gotten the list, you've narrowed it down, you have a few that you want to look at. The first thing to remember is, um, again, number one, don't get overwhelmed. Many families have gone through this process. The people that you're going to be calling at the communities are there to help you. So they're going to try to cover areas. If you don't ask the question, they're going to bring it up because they want you to be informed. They want you to have the resources you need to make the best decision. Um, look at that list that you made of your top two or three needs. If you've used that to filter now on the um, Assisted Living Compare website or any other places you're going, you'll be able to narrow your list down to maybe three to five communities. You don't really want to start calling every community around or you're going to get yourself stressed out and overwhelmed. So pick those top three to five, make those phone calls, but make those phone calls when the people that can help you are there. 
We get so many phone calls at night. And of course we have staff at night, but they're not there to help you with admission or move-in information. So they're basically gonna take a message and you're going to get a return call the next day. Make that call again on Monday through Friday during normal business hours. Now many communities may have a manager on duty uh, even through the weekend, but that doesn't mean that person is skilled at talking about all the move-in and admission information and payment and resources. So just, you know, if you really want to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, try to do it during the day. Or you possibly can go through the website of the community and make a request there so that someone can call you back. And make sure that when they're calling you back, you know you're going to be getting a call and pick up the phone. You know, we get a lot of requests that way. And when we make the phone call, people say, I never answer a phone from, uh, you know, a call from a number I don't recognize. Well, our numbers go through switchboards, so you may or may not always know the number. Uh, your call that you're making to the community will be a main number perhaps or could be a number from an ad. It doesn't mean that the person calling you back, if they're calling from a cell phone, like myself, I have a cell phone, it may not be the same number. So a lot of times we end up playing phone tag because the person won't take our call when we call them at their request. So when you have that first call, set a little bit of time, you know, a good solid 10 or 15 minutes. You're going to want to describe your situation, what's most important to you, the needs of your loved one. You're going to want to take notes and the person you're speaking with is going to ask you some questions. So if you have insurance numbers, they'll be able to do some insurance verification for things like therapies and they may be able to help you discern if their pharmacy is able then to accept your uh, loved one's uh, prescription plan and, and get your prescriptions paid for. All communities generally have a medical group that provides services. They have an optometrist, a dentist, a podiatrist, all kinds of ancillary providers, including counseling services. So that insurance information will be helpful. They're also going to be asking you about diagnoses. What are the top needs? Do you know what the medications are, or at least the top ones? Now, you don't have to give them the whole list on that first phone call, but it is helpful if you know mom or dad or whomever you're calling for take these particular heart medications, diabetes medications, particular you know, things that are um, of, of give us a sense of what that person's needs may be. Then you're also going to want to be able to uh, give that uh, person a sense of your timeline. Are you thinking about a move that needs to be made quickly because winter's coming and the person's struggling a little bit more? Maybe there's some memory loss and you're concerned the person could leave the home and get on the street and be at risk could be that your loved one is in a rehab center, maybe something's already occurred or happened, and so you need to make a decision more quickly, or you're just thinking ahead. So let them know your time frame, and then be prepared to talk a little bit about the payment. If this is private pay, then they're gonna tell you all about their rates and, and what they are, and they're gonna send you some information. If you're going to need that aid and attendance from the Veterans uh, Administration, then um, they're gonna help you uh, learn about that through your Veterans Services Commission, which is in H County, remember? And um, if you need Medicaid, they'll direct you to uh, how to start that application process and let you know if they have availability, if they have a waiting list, or if they even participate in the program. So you're gonna cover all those key topics in a short 15 minute phone call. If it's of interest to you and you wanna to go to the next level, then you're gonna arrange that virtual tour. That's the time to get your loved one involved if they can be, perhaps your siblings. And again, they can be a group call. They may also have videos that they can send you. We do. We'll send you little short one minute videos by text and you can see our different accommodations, the bathrooms, uh, all of our common areas. And then of course we redirect you to our website and also our Facebook pages so you can see lots more photos and information. And most communities are gonna be able to do that for you. The next thing you want to do is talk a little bit about their COVID um, preparations and restrictions and, and what have you. So most likely, <coughs> excuse me, you're not going to be visiting live, but they will offer Skype, FaceTime. Some may offer Zoom meetings with families, window visits, pretty much everyone is doing where you go to the outside of their room 
and you can visit through the window, through the screen, using cell phones. You can even use little washable markers and make drawings on the windows. People play tic-tac-toe, all kinds of things. And then they have outdoor visits. So the outdoor visits are either a booth or a porch area or an enclosed area with plexiglass where you can visit safely. You wear a mask. The visits are usually about 30 minutes. But of course, cold weather is coming here in Ohio. So we're preparing and thinking ahead to what that means for us. Sorry about that. The next thing you want to think about is with COVID, are there any other restrictions for family members? Some communities do not allow food to be brought in from the outside. They do not allow items to be delivered as soon as um, you bring them to the door. They may hold them. They may sanitize them. We sanitize all of our mail and all of our packages. Anything delivered to our loading dock has to sit there for at least 24 to 48 hours and that kind of thing. So learn about the requirements there before um, you know you make those moves. We're all dealing with COVID every day and doing our best to be as safe as possible. So the next thing you want to think about is, um, you know, here we go. What are you going to do um, about medical care? If you have a doctor in the community, will that doctor continue to see your loved one? You would probably have to take your loved one to the doctor's office. I would continue to maintain that for specialty doctors like cardiology or um, neurology, something like that. But for your everyday, you know, primary care physician or PCP, you may want to think about using the service at the community. Uh, likely they have a physician and a nurse practitioner. That saves you from having to take time off work or take someone back and forth to appointments that kind of thing. If someone leaves your building, your community uh, that you're choosing, they may have to go into a quarantine if they have an outside appointment. So be aware of that. It may be better for you to go ahead and utilize the services available at your community so your loved one is safe. They're not out in the you know big world where people are getting exposed every day and they're not going to have to go in quarantine because they had to have an appointment. Before you move into the community, if there's appointments that need to be done, go ahead and take care of those before moving. Get your haircuts. Although we have a you know beauty and barber salon in our buildings, and most do, go ahead and get that haircut in advance. Take care of things like um, routine visits because you're going to need medical information to give to the community anyway. Uh, we also have a history and physical form that most communities use that they've developed that's very common in our world. And uh, your community representative will give you that to take to the doctor or they'll send it to the doctor for you. Take care of appointments like the dentist. Take care of appointments if you need for anybody that needs a state ID, an update on their car. Uh, you know, anything that you can think of that's a routine kind of an appointment. Take care of those before you come in. Um, so that you don't even have to worry about whether or not the person has to leave uh, during the COVID time. Then you want to determine who's going to sign the paperwork. There is a lease at every community and there are many authorizations. You know, it could be the authorization for the medical care that we talked about. It could be that you're going to use the community's pharmacy. You may want to um, utilize the services of the podiatrist, the optometrist, uh, the dental group, you know, the therapy team. So all those require signatures and you're going to determine who is able to sign. Is it your loved one? They're still signing all their own paperwork. Do they have an individual that's been named power of attorney? Um, we often even have a wealth advisor and an elder law attorney and others who will sign all the paperwork and handle the payment. It's the family that makes the choices and decisions and participates in care conferences. So those are things you need to uh, you know, decide in advance so that everything goes smoothly. And signing paperwork can take you know, uh, easily 60 minutes to even two hours. Just depends on the community and, and what's involved. They may be able to send you paperwork in advance they would scan it, send it to you, you review it, you sign it, scan it back, but you're also going to be then reviewing it by phone because really it's a lot of information. It'd be a pretty extensive packet to just get in the mail and understand what you're signing. So there is a lease and then again all these authorizations and then a lot of good information. You know, it could be the menus, it could be information about um, how transportation is managed, could be the beauty shop list, you know, all those kinds of ancillary information, but somebody does want to review it with you. And then, um, as we've said in, in past programs, 
uh, we have uh, provided a whole program on what you want to bring with you. So whether it's furniture, uh, including the TV or a small computer or an iPad, you know, little kitchen appliances. Now, most assisted livings give you a fridge. They may give you a microwave. They may have a kitchen. They may have a kitchenette. You really only need those things for snacks. But some people have a Keurig, for instance. Uh, some people have... Um, ask about, can I bring a waffle maker? Can I bring this or that? Do I need a vacuum cleaner? So those are the things that you'll want to find out on that list and begin to assemble and um, you know get your, your list in order. Um, medications will be important. You're going to decide whether or not you're able to manage them as a family and you just go to your local pharmacy or your mail order group and you take care of the supply and you've got to maintain that 30-day supply. If someone runs out, the facility is likely going to require that you have to use their pharmacy because we can't let someone go without medication. It's probably going to be a convenience to you already to use the community pharmacy and they're going to be reviewing the uh, insurance information as we talked about earlier and let you know if your plan covers uh, the prescriptions through that pharmacy and most likely they will. I will recommend that if the community permits it, you go ahead and get your over-the-counter drugs on your own. So cough syrup and um, uh, you know Tums and uh, all this kind of stuff that's routine. Get those things at a discount store or a big box store. They'll still be kept at the community in the nursing card or in a medicine cabinet that they've provided. Um, you need a medical physician order for anything like that, but go ahead and get the over-the-counter things, <coughs> excuse me, inexpensively anywhere you can. It's the prescription drugs that you want to make the decisions about. And then the next thing you want to think about, <coughs> excuse me, is there anything else that you want to take, um, make decisions on, like um, are there magazine subscriptions, newspapers, uh, will your loved one need a cell phone or will the phone service at the community work? Probably at our community, a third of the people have no phone. If they get a phone call, we go through the front desk to the nurse's station. The person just comes right there and takes a call. We also have cordless phones that can be used throughout the building. About a third of the people have a landline and about a third of the people have a cell phone. So it's all up to you. Uh, if you have a cell phone, definitely get one that they can easily manage, you know, more like the jitterbug, if you will, versus the smartphone. If the person has, um, you know, some vision problems or problems with cognitive uh, abilities. So you decide, you'll know what's best for you and your loved one. So I hope that tonight we've covered, again, some of the basics on what is assisted living and how do you get started with it. Uh, as always, we welcome your questions and your comments. Uh, please feel free to put them uh, on, right under the post that you're going to see. You can also reach out to me directly. Again, my name is Carolyn, and <coughs> excuse me, I am at the phone number of 440-557-1104. 440-557-1104. You can also reach us just by calling uh, the Lantern of Chagrin Valley. They'll know who I am, and I'll be most happy to call you back. We do ask you to help us. Uh, this program has grown over the last three or four months. We now have almost 5,000 views per week. And that's really helpful to us because a lot of our referrals come from people who have connected with us one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So they've either met us in the community, they're watching a program like this, they are a referral of an existing you know, family, um, that kind of thing. So those kinds of referrals are important to us. So any way that you can help us by liking by making comments, by sharing, uh, that's really helpful to us. And again, we want to welcome any thoughts uh, you have for additional topics as well as additional speakers. So if you have uh, someone or you yourself have a service that relates to senior living, we'd love to know more about it, as long as it's going to help our families. Um, it's not a selling program. We're not selling anything. We're offering help and resources. So Again, uh, we thank you for tuning in each and every week to this program and the others that are offered by our Lantern Lifestyle Communities. We uh, wish you the best over this holiday weekend, keeping everyone safe. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And until then, I send you my best for today and always.